We're recording this on December 9th, 1994, and we are talking with Norton Warner, who is a Nebraska broadcaster whose principal stations are in Lincoln, although he started out in Kimball, Nebraska, and has successfully operated radio stations in other states throughout the Midwest. We'll talk about some of those, but we'll center on Nebraska today. Norton, welcome to the program, and uh, let's talk a little bit about how you got into broadcasting. How did you do that? Well, it was kind of one of those things that uh, I, I was starting out to be in show business and uh, decided that maybe the rewards were not as positive or, or as uh, assured uh, as they might be if I had a regular job. So uh, uh, the nearest thing was either television or radio. And somehow I got involved in a, in a, a radio and uh, enjoyed it. I liked the show business aspect of it. I uh, also loved the sales aspect of it, so it was a natural and, and uh, took $3,000 and went to Kimball and put the money down on a little tiny radio station and that's how it all got started. How did you hear about that station in Kimball? Oh, a friend of mine and I were looking for something and uh, he went with me. We went out to Wyoming and looked at a station in Wyoming and coming back from Wyoming he said he heard that a station in Kimball was for sale. and. We stopped and talked to the people, and sure enough, the station was in trouble and, and needed some, some management. So we stopped and talked to the board of directors, and, uh, and they were willing to take paper and not much down, and, and that's how it all happened. Why were you attracted to, uh, to the station in Kimball in terms of the, the potential of the community, the, the availability of it? What, what things went into the timing that would made it neat for you? Well. I started selling uh, major market radio and uh, about six months after I got into it I found it was very easy to sell. Where was and this? This was in Wichita, Kansas. It was very easy to, for me to sell. It was kind of a natural. It, for some reason I just, it just clicked. So then I got to thinking if, uh, if I got 15% of, of what I sold, uh, what happened to the other 85%? I thought maybe I'd like to have the other 85%. So I uh, thought maybe ownership would be a nice thing. So. The way Kimball was chosen was it was available, and the people that had it were in trouble and were willing to make a deal. But what a change from Wichita to Kimball, what a size of community from one to the other. How did you adapt to, to the style of operation in Kimball? That, that was a little tougher early on because in Wichita you would, you would wear a three-piece suit and, a, and, uh, and dress up and wear a hat and all this kind of thing. And, and uh, you get to Kimball and they were a lot more casual and so it took a little adapting to a market that had one stoplight in it uh, and uh, but you just think about it really uh, they're all one at a time uh, it, it, it's it's different but but it turned out to be an, uh, an extremely uh, a uh, good experiment because I could I could practice with commercials and see what would work and it was like a little clinic so it was great training. Small market radio is great training for anybody. What was the, um, the, the, the factors, the innovation apparently, but, but what were the factors that made your operation of uh, the KIMB and Kimball successful where the people who had it when you came along weren't, weren't successful? Well, one of the problems in radio over the years has been that uh, you'd get a bunch of the town citizens and they'd say, we want a radio station. We'd like to get one for our town. So you'd get an insurance man and a real estate man and a banker and so on and so forth and a lawyer to drop the papers for nothing and et cetera, et cetera. And, and they ended up with a, with a board of directors of very successful people in their own fields. But when it came to radio, they knew nothing about it. So they were at the mercy of outside um, uh, management. And so they'd go out and try to hire somebody. And of course, it's pretty easy to to snow people on, on these things if you know you can tell them what you can do and they'll buy into it. But they went through three or four managers that didn't work, that stole money, that did everything. I mean they went through the mill for about two years and uh, finally they said radio something else. We don't know anything about it. Which was difficult for otherwise successful people to admit. And uh, so they finally figured out that they needed a radio person and they needed somebody with integrity and so on and so forth. To, to, uh, to run it for them, and they were happy to get out of it because they couldn't figure out what the answers were. Well, radio in a rural area, in my experience, is something that is um, a magnet for the community. It provides business for the community. It provides interest in the community. How did those people 
convince um, you that, that the station had even potential? Well, uh, you, you could take a look at the retail sales in the county. Those figures were available. And then you could figure that probably 4 to 5% of that money would be spent on advertising. And then you'd say, well, I should be able to get at least half of it being a single station market with a weekly newspaper. And so then you take those figures and those are your goals and, and uh, go from there. It was, it was more or less what was done, what kind of retail sales were done in the county. Your, your businesses uh, from that station in Kimball uh, moved dramatically. You purchased numbers of stations. Take us through uh, the, uh, the stations that your company has, has owned uh, over the years. Well, we, uh, we got Kimball up and running and, uh, in about three years, and then uh, we bought Phillipsburg, Kansas, and, uh, and then we bought uh, Canyon City, Colorado, and then we bought Abilene, Kansas. So we had a number of small markets. And uh, what basically we do, we would pay for one, and then we'd buy another one and have two pay for one, and then we'd have three pay for one. And so uh, the, the figures worked out pretty well. Uh, then uh, in about 1970, I got a call from some people in Lincoln who had uh, KLIN and, uh, and, the, and AM and FM. And they were having problems making it work. And a young man that I trained in Kimball uh, by the name of Dick Dinsdale, uh, married Paul Shore's daughter, and Paul Shore was one of the owners. And he kept telling uh, these two owners, Shirtliff and Shore, that uh, Don Shirtliff, that uh, they ought to sell it to me. So they called me and wanted me to come down and uh, and made a, a special deal with me to to buy it because fact, they, as I recall, they particularly wanted you to have the opportunity to, to run the station because they thought you would be good for this community. For they time. did, they did, uh, and and Paul Shore. Uh, uh, was really one of my true benefactors in my life. Uh, uh, told me privately, he said, I'm going to get you this station. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to, to get you to own it. And, uh, and he was a great community-minded uh, individual, one of the best. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great relationship to come into, uh, a tough market, and a tough, everything was tough. There was nothing easy. But uh, you just keep fighting and fighting and eventually it comes around. But what a tribute to your entrepreneurial ability to have somebody essentially choose you to sell the station to because they thought that you could do something for the community. What, uh, what confidence and what, uh, what uh, kind thoughts uh, that they've provided for you there. Well, that's, that's true. And it was pretty much through Dick Dinsdale who uh, kept telling his father-in-law that I ought to own the radio station. And then, uh, so I have a great debt to uh, Dick Dinsdale for his support. Uh, it's... I don't know, you do good things, you work in a community, you're president of the chamber in your town and, and uh, you're president of the industrial corporation and you do all those things in the community and, and uh, uh, those kind of things, you know, you, you keep working at it and it gets noticed by people. Now, in the years that you have been in radio, which is uh, uh, really when you first started selling radio in, in Wichita prior to your acquisition of the Kimball station in 1960-61, what, what kinds of things are milestones? Oh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, one of the greatest milestones that I can remember, and this was in sales, uh, was the uh, invention of cartridges and the endless loop cartridge playback where you could do commercials on a tape. Uh, sounds funny, but when I first got into radio in about 1957, I think it was, uh, we had uh, commercials had to be put on a vinyl platter with a, with a um, uh, diamond needle. And I was the only one in the whole station who would take the time to produce and put commercials together and then put them on platters. Uh, but those platters were so soft that they wouldn't last very long. So it was a, it was a mess trying to be creative in, in commercials. And along came this... Uh, the cartridge, and to me, that was one of the big milestones. Uh, just prior to that, obviously, uh, uh, starting out in the 50s when I was in high school, uh, I graduated in 50 in high school, went through college, and I got to watch television uh, growing up. And then I got to listen to radio and it floundering around trying to find its niche and what it should be doing now that they didn't, uh, they had Amos and Andy on 
television and not on radio anymore. And uh, the Lone Ranger was on television, not on radio. So, so radio had to uh, had to survive, and to do it, they had to be very flexible and find another way to serve people, which they did. And it's been a marvelous medium for for being able to change to fit. Uh, probably uh, the second uh, most important thing that's come along in the, in, the, in the area of milestones has been uh, the fact that radio has had to find a niche. Each radio station had to find a niche in a market and had to be different uh, because there got to be so many radio stations. So if you have 20 radio stations, uh, you've got to find some kind of niche uh, some kind of lifestyle or, or define your audience and then go after that. Well, it, it meant you no longer had mammoth audiences like 40 or 50 percent of the audience in a market. You may only have 10 percent of the audience in a market, but that 10 percent might be exactly what some advertiser is looking for. And uh, this uh, effort to survive and find niches uh, has brought radio to the foreground today because the only, the only media that is surviving today is niche media. Media that really picks a, a definite niche, like a ski magazine, for instance, is a niche. And so if you want to advertise to skiers, you put it in a ski magazine. Well, the same thing applies to the niches that radio uh, comes up with. So the, the necessity for niche programming has brought about some uh, tremendous advantages in radio, and it's just blossoming today. When did you um, perceive that uh, the uh, proliferation of the idea that there ought to be niche programming in terms of when you were operating stations? When did you first start pegging your stations specifically to those very dramatic or very, uh, very specific niches, I should say? Uh, in Lincoln, uh, I would say it probably, uh, well, since 1971 when we first came to Lincoln. Uh, because we at that time had a beautiful music FM and of course uh, that seemed to be what everybody thought of when they thought of FM and so we had a beautiful music station and it fit a definite niche and it just skyrocketed. Uh, at that time AM radios were still playing music but a different kind of music and then you also had country stations and so on so there was a certain uh, niche a uh, bit of programming then. Sometimes it was a niche done by, by better personalities on one station than on another one. Uh, it might have been done by uh, better news on one than on another one. But they had rock radio at that time. So everybody tried to find something where they were just a little bit different and, and definable to the public. And uh, uh, it's probably been going on in all markets that had three or more radio stations for a long time. Each station had to find something different to uh, hang their hat on. So uh, in, in uh, Kimball, we didn't have that problem because we were a single station market. We could do just about anything you wanted to do and did. But uh, <coughs> even in that market, we had, uh, we had competition and we acted like we had competition on every corner. So we tried to be as sharp as if we indeed we're competing with a KOA out of Denver, uh, which in effect we were. So we had to be sharp on news and sharp on things that we did. You couldn't just slop around in it and make money because people knew better for a long time. What other milestones come to mind? Well, I think probably uh, the, the uh, outside of the, the technical things like uh, 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 solid state and those kind of things that did away with tubes. Uh, it really didn't, it was important, but it really didn't affect radio as far as the public was concerned. Uh, what's happening today is probably the greatest niche or the greatest change or milestone that I've ever seen in the broadcast industry, and that is that uh, the advent of, uh, of uh, digital recording and computer operations uh, where you can now uh, put three hours of music and voice on an FM radio station and have it play and you do that as, a, as an air personality, you can do that in 20 minutes, walk away and it plays and you can't tell the difference. It is just unbelievable what's happening with uh, digital sound and computers. And I've asked many people because, uh, as in all industries, uh, 
it's getting more and more difficult to make it with high-priced people, the costs of people, finding the right people, and so on. So uh, I've asked people how they're going to keep their profits up and keep things rolling, and they say the little black box, which means computers and digital sound. And they're putting uh, entire libraries of music on, uh, uh, on digital, as you know. Uh, we just installed a, a new digital production system which has four tracks, just like a tape recorder, but it's all done in digital. Just phenomenal stuff. Uh, and, and that's the hard part to keep up with. I mean, you've really got to be looking into the future. And you can't be too far ahead, but you can't be too far behind. You know, we got a little too far ahead in the last two or three years in Lincoln in that uh, we went with some audio equipment, uh, digital audio equipment, but it was not perfected. And so we'd have a little glitch here and there. And uh, a commercial might get cut off or something would run over another one or something. And uh, we'd get a phone call and say, you guys are better than that. Why can't you run it, keep that from happening? Well, it was just the advanced state that we were trying to get into. And uh, we were taking some of the bugs out of the digital uh, broadcasting. And Norton, you've been um, very well known for your success in sales and developing sales programs and so forth. And we want to talk about that, but, but let's reflect just a little bit on the fact that you said that you were interested in show business when you got in. And one of the hallmarks, I think, of a, a broadcaster who is very successful in radio is the product that comes on the air. So with your show business orientation and your understanding of programming, how did you apply those kinds of things? When you were in Kim or when you were in other stations and you analyzed programming, how did you relate that to the audience? Well, uh, I always felt that, that whenever you had uh, the radio on and somebody was listening, it's much like uh, if they were indeed viewing, let's say, Andy Williams was a big star at the time, okay? And Andy Williams had uh, MacArthur's Park, which was a song, okay? So if you're in show business and you put Andy Williams on stage live and you're sitting in the audience and you're watching him perform, and he reaches that end high note that goes up and then it goes up and then it goes even further up. Well, you would never in a million years run out while he's holding that high note, grab his microphone and say that was Andy Williams and blah, 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 because he's still holding his high note. See? Well, it's a touch of show business. It's timing. Uh, it's, it's, being, it, it's looking and sounding spontaneous but having things planned out. It's, it's brevity. Uh, it, it, it's all aspects of show business. And uh, if you apply those to what you do on, on the air, it, it all makes sense. Uh, so it, 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 then the other thing that, that I enjoyed was that I understood uh, show business personalities, the ego of a show person, uh, which is sometimes very difficult because in radio they never know whether they're doing well or whether they're not. They don't hear any applause. They never hear the radio being clicked off. So they become very, uh, they're always looking around saying, wow, I wonder if that one went over. I don't know, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And, and so they become paranoid about how they're doing. And so you, 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 it takes a certain ability and talent to recognize this and to keep them up. Uh, so that's all a part of show business. And, and having been in show business for a while, I know the feeling. You know, if you're out on stage with a microphone, however, you can tell whether you go over fair or not so good. But you still always have that thing that you want somebody afterward to come up and say, great job, nice job, pat you on the back. You need that encouragement. And so working with, with uh, air people is, is, uh, is a lot easier if, if you've been through it yourself. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, the sales component of the way that all of this works. Sometimes people uh, venture the thoughts that a particular station is very successful on the air, but is not very successful financially, and that's because, of course, that they are not able to to get the uh, the support that they need. Talk about how those kinds of things fit together, please. Well, uh, all stations can't be number one in the market, and all stations can't be in a position where they they have a great audience and can just sit back and take phone calls and clip coupons and so on and so forth. Uh, so to me, what you have to do in any market is to act as if you're last in the market, even though you may be first. Uh, because if you do that, then you are 
uh, you are concerned with clients, uh, you're concerned with serving them, you're concerned with their growth and their profits and, and, uh, and with their goals and their aspirations. And, and that ought to be the way sales works. There's no question about it. The problem with becoming, quote, number one, which some stations uh, uh, get to an enviable position in, the, in, that, in that way, the problem with it is that all of a sudden they come in, they're no longer concerned about the client, they're concerned with whether I have this avail for you or that avail for you or how many would you like to buy, and, and they don't care about the client. See? And it's a, uh, so it's, it's a lot easier to sell and to work with clients if you have a good audience, that is a large audience, one that will respond to their advertising. Uh, but over the years I have been able to take uh, an audience that is one tenth the size of another station's audience and get more results f for that from that audience than the other one uh, because of all the factors that goes go into uh, successful advertising it's uh, the two are connected uh, uh, there's if I had to have a number one station and sell the way we sell or a number eight station and sell the way we sell I would obviously take a number one but, having said that, you ha one has to understand that being number one doesn't necessarily be, mean that you're the best buy for a given type of business. The number four station may be a ten times better buy, or the number seven station might be a ten times better buy than the number one station for a given audience or, a, or that, the customer of that, uh, that uh, client. You bring up the fact that there needs to be this relationship between the people who operate the station and uh, the uh, their clients, the uh, business people in the area that they serve, and that leads us to the discussion of the role of the radio station in the community. You have experience operating radio stations in a variety of different cities and towns in uh, throughout the Midwest, and including the ones that we've discussed in Kimball and Lincoln. But the radio station you've alluded to, the fact that the, there's participation in the Chamber of Commerce and other kinds of issues. Talk about how the manager of the radio station, the owner of the radio station, has to play a role in terms of the way that this works as far as the fabric of society fits together. Well, I think it has to be so intertwined and, and uh, uh, so thorough in, in community involvement, so thoroughly ingrained in community involvement uh, that uh, Anyone who has a worthwhile project would like to get that radio station or group of stations to support their project. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, when I first came to Lincoln, uh, one thing that I wanted to do was eventually become the uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce because I've always loved chamber work. Uh, I think it's I think it's most rewarding for the community and and. Uh, all business involved and uh, so when you do that and you work and work and work and work for the city for the community uh, you uh, get paid for that one way or another uh, there is compensation for all the effort that you put forth uh, in in working for a community and the more you put forth uh, the more you get in return and uh, uh, it's it's just absolutely a must for people to get involved in their communities because you really become one of the voices of the community uh, whether it's television or newspaper or radio uh, all those voices working together can help build a pretty good pretty good community you have wide contacts with people around the country you're known to broadcasters um, throughout the united states you've chosen to operate your stations in nebraska kansas and colorado why did you choose those states well, growing up in Kansas uh, and then buying our first radio station in Kimball uh, and then knowing some of the challenges in other, in other markets, uh, what I find is that in, in, uh, in Kansas and Nebraska, I think the same is true in Iowa, uh, perhaps in Missouri. I'm not as well acquainted with Missouri, but I think it's true there too. There's a certain work ethic in those Midwestern states that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, the, the, the young people are just different uh, than they are in other markets. Uh, we've owned markets in, uh, 
in Colorado, and I have to tell you that the work ethic there is different. I almost can't cope with Colorado work ethic. Uh, it's uh, the, the people spend more time thinking about where they're going to go river rafting or skiing or, or fishing or whatever on the weekends than they do about the job when they're doing their job. You know, and, and uh, it's very difficult to get their attention. They, they just don't seem concerned. It is hard to find good people uh, with the work ethic that Nebraskans have especially. Uh, I think it's also, I learned a long time ago, I talked with, uh, with an, uh, an investor group uh, about buying radio stations and we were talking about maybe buying something down south, uh, you know, to still you can go down for the winter at your radio station in the south. And, and I'll never forget, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, you buy a little radio station in Nebraska or Iowa, make enough money so you can go live in the south. But he said, the ones in the south don't make any money. So various areas of, of, uh, of the, and I'm not talking the giant stations, I'm talking about the kinds of stations that I could afford to, to have purchased at the time. But uh, I just think that, uh, that the Nebraska climate of all of them, uh, has probably the best business climate uh, in America. Talk about how competitive radio is in the markets you operate. Well, of course, if you're in a single station market, it doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, we've got uh, the stations, many of the stations we had were uh, single station markets or AM and FM in a market, so they weren't. Uh, what you really had to compete there against was yourself and make sure you were as good as you could be. Uh, Lincoln has been the most competitive and uh, and you you kind of you kind of keep one eye on competition but uh, you can't let competition uh, dictate what you do. Talk about the quality of broadcasting in the Midwest as compared to other parts of the country quality of the signal, you mentioned the work ethic of course is important, the quality of the programming, the kinds of things that are done as far as community involvement in Nebraska, Kansas, and so forth. Uh, it's awfully hard to speak to that because you can, you can uh, even in Nebraska, you can get on Interstate 80 and go out and turn on some radio stations and you wonder how in the world they even stay on the air. They are so bad, so poorly programmed, so it, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, by the same token, you'll find some great ones. The great ones are a little more difficult to find uh, as you're traveling around uh, uh, because what I found out a long time ago was that if you're going to, if you're going to really be good at what you do, uh, you, can't be, you can't be a leader in sales and a leader in programming probably at the same time. You can have a feel for programming, but uh, but I am convinced today that, that uh, program consultants are an absolute necessity. People that really know the subtleties of programming and can get down and make things work on the air. Uh, we have, for a long time, had some great radio stations in Lincoln. I think if you were to take all of them together uh, and, and uh, talk about the, the programming, we would be head and shoulders above most communities of our size. They're all well programmed and well, uh, well worked. They sound good. Um, Let me turn in a slightly different direction for you and ask you to think about what I'm going to refer to as memorable moments. Things that are sometimes um, tragedy, sometimes comedy, some kinds of of achievements, but those kinds of things that, that come to mind to you from uh, some of the kinds of things that you are aware of in terms of broadcasting in the radio business? I think probably the, uh, the most memorable moment in my life was uh, coming down to Lincoln and meeting with uh, Don, Shore, Don Shirtliff and Paul Shore. And, and, and the thrill of the possibility of coming to Lincoln, Nebraska uh, and and I, th the whole negotiation program that went on with with uh, Shore and Shirtliff uh, about this thing was was just a thrill from beginning to end. Uh, little little things you remember, 
like uh, Don Shirtliff. Uh, we were sitting at breakfast and he said, uh, could you give us some names of some people in uh, Kimball that we could call so we could kind of, as references. So I said, Don, I'll tell you what I'll do. When I get back, I'll send you a phone book. Just call anybody. Well, he thought I was trying to be smart, but Shore recognized that I wasn't. I said, I'm serious. I said, I know everybody in the county. They know me. Just, just pick up the phone and call. Well, that's, that's kind of a thrill to be able to say that, not have to pick out one or two people you think might give you a good reference. And, uh, but I, I, think, I think moving to Lincoln was such a mammoth move for us from that little town to, uh, to coming to Lincoln and, and uh, buying a home and looking at the prices of homes from what we were uh, used to living in there. And it was just, it was unbelievable. It was a giant step. I mean, it was scary. It was really scary. Uh, How is the, the number of years which uh, have uh, transpired since you've come to Lincoln, how has that met your expectations? What you thought it was going to be at that time when you were negotiating, and how has it proved out? We now have the ability to look back. Well, I've always been one to say it proves out about the way you work at it. And, and if you've got a dream and you've got things in your mind and you work at it, uh, then things do come about. And so it pretty much played out the way I thought it would. Your stations have very luxurious studios on O Street. Mm -hmm. Was that part of the dream? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I'll never forget, uh, we were down on uh, L Street in kind of cramped little quarters and scrubby looking little quarters. And, and I went to Bill Smith at, at, uh, at that time, First National, and I was talking to Bill about I've got a chance to buy this land out on O Street and uh, build a building out there. And he said, uh, he said, well, we're, gonna, we're building out at 56th and O. And he said, why don't you, uh, we'll build at 56th and O, and uh, uh, you can take the third or fourth or fifth floor in our building for First National. At First National, I said, Bill, I'll tell you what, why don't I build a building and you take the third, fourth, or fifth floor in my building? And he <laughs> looked at me and he said, got your point. I just think that, that radio is such an intangible uh, uh, thing, so intangible that, that you've got to have something tangible. And so I've always felt good about having, having things look like you mean business and look like you're in business to stay. Who designed the building? Uh, I did. And I probably should have had somebody else do it. It would have probably been done better. But it was fun, right? It was fun. And I, you know, for about two years I sat down in our den and, and uh, had a drawing board and was always drawing and moving doors and moving this and moving that. And my kids were asking, Diana, uh, when will daddy get through drawing? Uh, so it took a long time, but, uh, but it's all worth it, good, bad, or indifferent. You operate, you mentioned in terms of some of your markets, and here in Lincoln you operate an AM station, an FM station, and you also now have the uh, operation of a third station. Talk mm -hmm. about what it's like to operate multiple stations compared to the days when you operated KIMB and Kimball as a single station in a single station market? It's, uh, if you've got two stations, it's more than twice as tough to run it. If you've got three stations, it's about six times tougher to run it. It is very difficult to get your mind to think compartmentally in it because you're always, you're, all of your efforts say, well, let's, let's do some promotion on this radio station. Then you forget these two. You say, wait a minute, what about this one? Oh, we better do something for this one too. And you, it is difficult to get your wheels turning in three directions at one time. And I think that's probably the most difficult uh, thing that I've run into. Uh, we're starting to get a handle on it. It, it takes us a while to, to get used to running three stations out of one uh, facility. There, there's a certain amount of uh, economic uh, considerations in uh, in running the stations out of one. We don't have more rent to pay, prob very little utilities to pay. A lot of the people do double duty on several stations and and so there are some economic advantages to running more than than uh, than one or two stations and it's 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 been good. I when, don't know where they'll ever stop with how many you can own in a market. But That was essentially the, the, where I was going with this. 
Uh, when you first came to Lincoln, there were this was a complicated market compared to, as you pointed out, Kimball. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot more stations that are licensed to Lincoln now than when you came. Well, they're not licensed to Lincoln. Uh, the stations which operate in Lincoln, I guess yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll go got, with that. You've got a Crete station on the edge of Lancaster County and a, and a Beatrice station on the edge of Lancaster County and a Seward station on the edge of Lancaster County all beaming signals in. And I think they eventually get a, probably get a license designation uh, or at least the right to call themselves a Lincoln radio station. But they were all imports and yeah, it's a, it, it becomes quite a battle. How does that fit together with, with uh, the way that one operates a station in terms of the numbers of signals that come in? And I guess where I'm going with that is that looking at the ability to deliver signals from cable systems, from satellites, and so forth. What, what's that do for the local radio operators such as you're successfully doing? Well, it's like all competition. It makes you get better. Uh, it, uh, it, put you on your toes, you've got to, you've got to, uh, uh, you've got to know more about your own audience of each of your radio stations. You've got to uh, uh, do a better job of working with clients. Uh, you've got, anymore what's happening is you, you, you're going to have to know your listeners by name. This gets into these databases so that if you've got a certain database of listeners for an AM station, you know who they are by name. Now, you may not know all of them, but you'll have five or six or 8,000 of them in a computer. And if you're, if you're going to make a change, you, you mail something to them. Tell them you're making a change so you keep in touch with them. And this is true with both FM stations. Uh, so I, I, think the, I think the competition has just forced everybody if you're going to succeed, to get a lot better at what you do. We spend, we spend more time in training today, especially in sales training, uh, by far than we, in, in, in one year than we probably spent in five years before. Uh, because you've just got to be better at what you do. And when you're working with, uh, when you're working with clients, uh, there are so many factors in whether that client becomes successful by virtue of their radio purchase, their radio advertising. And, uh, and there are so many people out there selling radio who have not the foggiest idea of how to make it work. And then the poor client becomes a victim of that, of that person. And then, and then what happens is the old, I tried radio once and it didn't work. I mean, that's, that's a result of, of people who don't know what they're doing. Uh, they set false expectations and uh, they really don't know what they're doing with, with advertising and, and, and what the client needs to be doing with it. You've, um, when you purchase some stations, you sold some stations in your group. Tell us what is the current status of the stations that are under your license. Uh, right now we own uh, an AM and FM in Canyon City, Colorado and uh, AM in Beatrice and then the three stations here in Lincoln. And uh, that's it. We've sold all the, all the other markets. What, uh, what do you see as the future for the stations in those small towns that you are no longer operating in? It depends on the town. There is a, there is a point uh, where you are probably ought to be out of the market. Uh, Kimball has probably uh, reached that point. Uh, Kimball right now... Uh, is probably 3,500 and it's probably not going to grow very much. And it's very difficult for uh, individual businesses to make money in Kimball. There's so much competition. I mean, the Walmart's 60 miles away and, and the Targets and everybody else that, that are just right up the highway. And it's very difficult for those small towns. Uh, a community like Beatrice, I think, will, will make it well. It's big enough, it's over the hump. Uh, they've got some great leadership in Beatrice uh, for economic development. It's going to be connected with a four-lane highway with the interstate. That town's going to make it. It's going to do okay. On the other, ha on the other side, uh, Fairbury is going to have a little tougher time of it. They may make it, but it's, they're going to have a tougher time at it. Uh, Canyon City, Colorado is going to blossom. They've just got a a major penitentiary, a uh, federal penitentiary put in about six or eight miles from there and, and it's going to be about a thousand people hired. 
So that market's going to continue and, and it's going to be okay. But there are a lot of markets that uh, you need to look at. It's not a, it's not a shoe in anymore. Talk about the uh, features of AM uh, versus FM radio in terms of uh, the, um, the audience uh, response to it. Are you talking the technical features I'm or talking about programming the, features? Um, I guess all of the above, but I'm really interested in how they will or will not uh, blossom. Well, AM is finding a niche in the talk format. Uh, the other niche that AM seems to be working at is uh, uh, the oldies, the 1940s music, where if you put that 40s music on an FM station, you'd say, wait a minute. Do you like some of that music yourself? Uh, no, I really don't. I, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I bought a, you know, one of those things they put on TV uh, where you get five CDs, and I thought, boy, I just love that. So I, I bought that doggone thing, and, and, I, and I put it in, and I have to tell you, I... I cannot live in the past. It, it, it makes me feel bad. It depresses me. Uh, there are a lot of people that love it. Uh, but, but AM will handle that kind of music because the fidelity is not a factor. And yet AM, AM side by side, uh, except for stereo, and, and if you've got AM stereo, you can't tell the difference between that and FM. Uh, most people don't go at it that strongly, but but uh, AM will handle news talk. Uh, a lot of stations you'll see are sports, all sports. Uh, so they're going more into talk or older music. At one time, AM can handle country. Anymore, there are enough country FMs to where AM is losing out on country. Uh, so AM, AM formats will be limited. Uh, FM, uh, there are some markets where they're even putting talk on FM. But FM, you can take a niche of music and, uh, and do pretty well with it. Uh, but in about five to ten years, we're going to have digital in here. And that's going to change the whole concept of everything. And I'm still not sure how that's going to work. Uh, but it, uh, it indeed will be interesting. Sometimes people talk about uh, the changing world and they talk about uh, the delivery of audio by means of uh, computer technology and they talk about uh, delivery of audio by means of satellite and uh, it always then comes back to the discussion as to how does the, uh, the, uh, the audio medium serve the local needs. And we talked about that a little bit. I wonder if you can now take the information that you used before and project into the future and see how you would suppose that the local audience is going to be survived or going to, going to help the local radio station survive? Uh, that's the question that uh, when we get together as a group of owners, we all sit around and talk about that question by the hour. Uh, we've had some scary things on the horizon uh, that uh, there's, a, there's a service out now that cable puts out called DMX, I think it is. 30 or 35 different niches of music. Digital Music Express. Digital Music Express, is that what it is? Okay. And so here we are sitting here with a niche of music on an FM radio station, and they come in and put one on. Uh, but it's narrower than ours. Okay. So you talk about niche. Uh, so we sit around and we, and, and we just get white thinking about it. Uh, but so far, and it's been in, it's been in a, a couple of smaller markets of people that I know who own radio stations, so far it has made no difference whatsoever. And we've been trying the last couple of years to figure out why it hasn't made a difference and why it hasn't affected radio broadcasters, uh, why it hasn't a, a, a country niche on DMX versus a country niche on the air. Why, why doesn't this one, since it has no commercials and no talk and no nothing, why doesn't it overtake the one that has talk and commercials and stuff? And, and, and I'll tell you what, there's a thing we call stationality, that, that you, you develop a loyalty in a certain group of people. It's human beings. It's people talking to people. It's contests. It's fun. It's something going on. And people don't like that other thing. It, there's just nothing there but music. And so to have just music is like eating straight chocolate syrup without the ice cream. It just doesn't feel the same. So we're finding, we're finding very little uh, competition but the, in, in, from outside sources. 
what we're finding is that that radio uh, is is developing or has to develop the stationality so that it it it's kind of in and of itself it's a personality it's a human being and people either like it or don't like it and hopefully you have enough people liking it where you can sell advertising that reaches those people uh, we found for instance that uh, the stationality almost has to be consistent throughout the, the given station for instance we have Rush Limbaugh on it uh, on when he comes on live well He's, he's a conservative, and he's a hard hitter, and he makes a lot of people mad. <coughs> so we as programmers sit around and say, well, maybe we ought to put a couple, three hours of a, somebody that has the opposite point of view on so we make more people happy. And what they're finding is that when you do that, you make everybody mad. And so what they're finding is that if you are a Rush Limbaugh type radio station, your whole audience, your whole radio station ought to be a, in that mold in a way. And I'm not saying, uh, you just can't get into a very liberal programs with a very conservative Rush Limbaugh because then you gotta, you're two different people. And so it's, it's interesting what's evolving out of this talk medium. Uh, the same thing evolves out of music media in that you can't be one thing between 10 and 3 and another one between 3 and 6 and something else between, because nobody knows who you are, when. Uh, so you develop a stationality <clears throat> and then people kind of kind of get addicted to it because of the human aspect of it. And when you do that, uh, you then don't have to worry about about others. I mean, I, as a human being, you don't go around worrying about who your friends are. Say, gee, I need to go make some more friends. They're your friends, and you don't have to worry about competition, whether they like somebody else too. And I think it's a lot it's a lot that way in the radio business. So you if you take care of your own listeners, your own people, and you do your own thing and you do it well, uh, you're gonna make it. One of the things that of course is always um, interesting for discussion is that radio and television are licensed by the federal government. In your years in the in the uh, business what kind of adjustments or changes in the FCC policies have you found uh, that impacted the way that the, uh, the business operates and, and, in fact, the decisions that you have to make as an owner? Uh, if anything, it's, uh, the, there is less regulation today, less problems today, less uh, concern about whether you have offsetting programming to Rush Limbaugh. Uh, we don't think about that as much. And of course, a lot of that came around when they started deregulating various industries. And they deregulated us to where we don't even have to have to have a program log anymore where it tells what's on and what commercials are on. But did we get rid of them? You can't do it. You've got to have that program log. And it's the same program log we had when we were regulated. But the thing, that, the thing that is fascinating about it is, whatever the laws were or are today, uh, if you're doing it right, you're following all the laws. I mean, if the laws weren't there, you'd be doing it the same way today. The only thing I think that we get into a hang up on is, is when they start thinking that the airwaves belong to the public and therefore they can tax us out of existence. And I think there are a lot, of, a lot of people out there who have developed this, this thing like, well, you, you're using my airwaves. I mean, you should pay taxes and you can't have on Rush Limbaugh because I don't agree with him and on and on and on. It's, but it isn't theirs. Any more than an attorney talks to a client and gets paid $500 an hour for it and we're gonna, we're gonna tax him because he uses the airwaves for that voice to go from him to the client or to the judge or whatever. It's the same principle. But they think we need to pay for that, see. And so, but we do, we pay taxes and so on. But recently, uh, there was a, uh, in watching some of the things happen, uh, uh, the president wanted to have all broadcasters pay for the GATT program, which in, in a few years, we would have paid somewhere between five and 10% of our gross revenue to Uncle Sam to support GATT. No relationship, no benefit, 
no nothing. It's just that you broadcasters have got a lot of money. And probably 30 to 40 to 50 percent of the, of the broadcasters out there are losing money today. And it, it's just unreal how that kind of thinking uh, can get, invo get involved in our industry. Because everybody thinks that broadcasters are rich cats. And, and sure, they make good money, but so do doctors, so do attorneys, so do accountants, so do people in your profession, <laughs> Larry. They're making good money. And, uh, uh, but I think that, that uh, in spite of all of that, uh, the people like uh, our, our National Association of Broadcasters and, and their performance has just been super in stopping that. I mean, they bring it to our attention, and then we get a hold of our people, and so democracy works, and our voice is heard. Uh, but those kind of things, those kind of things scare me a little bit about, uh, about people thinking that the airways are theirs and, and broadcasters should uh, not have a free reign. What's your uh, thought towards uh, the Let's put it this way. What's your favorite type of radio program? You as a, you as a viewer, you as a listener. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, my type of music probably isn't being played on any Lincoln radio station today. Uh, nor is my wife's. And I've often told her that, you know, if you or I were to program our radio stations, we'd have very few listeners. And of course, the reason that I ask that is the question, the follow-up question is, how does one make the decision what kind of music you put on a station? Well, you, you take a look at the market, and you find out what niche seems to be available. And sometimes there's an obvious niche, uh, sometimes it isn't so obvious. Sometimes there's a niche that's being filled, but being filled poorly. And so then you've got to decide, well, gee, I'm going to take that niche and I'm going to do it better than that person. Uh, so it, it just it, it, it depends on the market itself, uh, and, and each market, you know, to take what we're doing in Lincoln on our radio stations and move it to another market and do it automatically would be, might be disaster. When you uh, purchase the radio station in Beatrice, it's an AM only radio station, standalone AM mm -hmm. as it's sometimes called, and there are people who in, in current times say it's desirable to have an AM, FM combination or multiple stations as you operate in Lincoln. How did you decide to go for an AM only station? Well, Beatrice is a great town. Quibi is a well-known radio station. Uh, and the person that is uh, the general manager right now and who will eventually own the radio station uh, is an AM person. They understand AM. There is an AM station mentality that is different from an FM station mentality. Expand on that a little bit. Well, I don't know whether I can or not, except that, except that the, the AM person uh, uh, has more of a leaning toward events, uh, uh, certain promotions, and, and community involvements. Uh, they will talk longer. Uh, they don't mind if they have an interview on the air that goes for a half hour. Uh, they do do play-by-play -play sports, and there's a certain group of events and things that go with AM radio. And if you take those over and put them on an FM radio, they would still go. But the FM mentality is more of let's play music and commercials, and we'll find it with our music niche. The music defines the niche. Whereas over here, everything defines the niche. We're everything to the community. And, and uh, in many cases, somebody who is, say, over over 50, chances are will be more of an AM operator than they will an FM operator because that's probably what they grew up with. And, and AM is fun. It can be a lot of fun. You can go do remotes and do all kinds of sizzle and all kinds of stuff on an AM station that, that would chase off a music listener. How much of the radio station's programming reflects the personality of the general manager? Uh, <laughs> well... I think a lot of it should, uh, but there are people who's, who do not let their personalities get involved with what's going on uh, because it's, it's good programming. And uh, you'll have some air personalities in talk radio that'll say some things and boy, you'll just cringe and say, boy, don't say that. But 
in order to get people to sit up and pay attention and to get involved, they do say funny things. They say things that, that are come off the wall and you say, boy, I'd never do that. But for that personality, it'll work. And so uh, right now, uh, my daughter Lisa is the general manager of all three radio stations. And I've, I've taken a back seat and, and, uh, and I don't tell her what to do. Uh, she, you know, she'll listen to a suggestion, but I can't tell her what to do. And, and uh, right now, for instance, she works uh, with all three radio stations, but she understands the AM and FM better than she understands the country station. She has not yet gotten into that as much as she is into Star 107 and, and the talk radio. Uh, but she understands, you know, I say, Lisa, how does, how's FM sounding? Uh, Star 107, how's that sound? In fact, it was her idea to change it to Star because Easy 107 had a connotation that didn't fit the music. I said, okay, you know, uh, do whatever you want to do. And I have to ask her how it sounds. How does it sound? I can listen to it, but I don't know. Are you an AM guy? I'm an AM guy, yeah. And, she, and she'll tell me, it is dynamite. It is, sounds super. I'll take your word for it. So does my personality get involved with that? No, I don't know what she's doing. But over the years, when you were in Kimball, when you were operating the stations in Kansas and Colorado, how much of, of what you saw as priorities there were ones that you said to yourself, as an entrepreneur, as an operator, as somebody who was involved in the community, I want this to happen. Oh, I, I think a lot. I think a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, and this may be true in, say, a weekly newspaper or a small town daily or something, but I know it's true in radio. Uh, that radio station is, a, it, is so sensitive to the leadership of the management. Uh, it's just totally sensitive. And if you're not watching it, and you're not taking care of it, and you're not nurturing it and working with it, and watching every little detail, it'll, it can get away from you, and, and it can become a bad radio station in a quick hurry. So yeah, it it it, it depends a lot on the on the management and the work ethic in Nebraska, and the work ethic in Nebraska, the work ethic of the manager as well as the people who are the individuals who operate mm -hmm. the station. Mm -hmm. Norton, we've come to the end of the time that we've asked you to, to participate with us. We thank you very much for your discussion. It's fun to talk with you about many things, and you've made a nice contribution to the Nebraska Broadcasting History Project. Thank right. you. Hope it helps, Larry. It's nice to be asked. Thank you.